Welcome back everyone, Southern Technical College. We're with Professor Stephen Williams and he's going to continue telling us about electronic motor controls. Not necessarily electronic, however, motor controls is the bottom line. All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the individual parts and pieces that we drew up on the board and see what they really look like, how they really operate, okay? Now, did you want to mention that change you made on the board? Yeah, let's uh, look at that real quick. You notice in the first one I kind of hem hauled and decided to back off. Well, I ended up changing here because I was actually showing my, the way I had it shown was in series. Well, if you look at the actual connections shown on the uh, drawing as they go, one, two, three, four. This part of the coil actually comes over to the number four terminal, and this part goes over to number three terminal. All right, and in order to make them in parallel, essentially what you need to do is put a jumper across two and three, and one and four. And in so doing, basically, you connect them in parallel. And I knew I didn't want to sit there and scratch my head. So uh, at this point, they're shown in parallel, which is what they in were intended to be. All right, because again, when it's in parallel, you need, with a higher voltage, okay, you need more windings on the... Um, primary side with the lower voltage you need less windings because you're stepping down less all right so when you're stepping down less essentially to get the same amount of power you put two coils in parallel all right and essentially what that means is jumper two to three one to four all right and you end up with Again, the 24 volts either way, where if I'm using a higher voltage, basically I would jump from the 3 to 4 together, which is what I showed the first time, and that puts them in series, but that's for the higher voltage, not the lower one. And then I was also asking about the lights, why he had the green for off and red for on, because in my mind, green means go, but in this case he was saying with red showing use caution, because the motor is on, whereas green is safely, meaning the motor is off. So I thought that was interesting to note as far as the colors go too. All right, so getting back to some of these things. So what is this first guy that we're looking at? It says that it's a 10 amp, a 240 volt, three amp on the other side there. Oh, and it says tech push button. Yeah. A few screws on the underside, you'll notice they're labeled one, two, three, and four. And another screw on that side, as well as on the other. All so right, so let's, let's look at this. I'm going to operate the rotary, whoops, operator. So it's just like a turn on, turn off switch, kind of. But notice in the back, as I rotate it, there's a cam that's rotating and there's a plunger. The green and red thing that pops out. That's the contacts changing state. So as I'm rotating, okay, and you'll notice that one of them is a normally closed contact and one of them is a normally open contact. So you've got one and two for normally open, three and four for normally closed. I'm sorry, the other way around. One and two for normally closed, three and four for normally open. And the NC means normally closed and the NO means normally open? That's correct. Okay. Now, one of the things that, let's look at one that I pulled apart here. You can see the plungers on the back, okay, that are pushed in by the rotary cam. Okay, 
Look at the shape of the cam as I rotate it one way or another. It is, you can feel the snap action as I rotate. Okay, and what it's doing is it's pushing the cam. The cam is actually pushing the plungers down. Okay, simultaneously. And also in the uh, chapter, if you read it into this yet, if not, you will be seeing it. They talk about the ability to, to add extra blocks. Now, this is the contact blocks you can see that you can get. One is a normally open block. One is a normally closed block. Now okay. I'm noticing that the normally open is associated with the green and normally closed is associated with red. Is that normally how it goes or is that just... Yep. That's, okay. In fact, it's, it's a unique feature. It, it's, a, it's a basically another way of being able to confirm what's being done here. Now, this particular um, selector switch has stackable contacts. For example, you can take them now and you can either, and you can buy individual contacts, okay? If I wanted to put normally closed and normally closed, okay, you take that off and you just screw it into place there. Screw it into the other contact block. Righty tighty lefty loosey. Righty tighty lefty loosey. God, she learns. It's terrible. <laughs> All right. And now you've basically got a selector switch with four contacts two normally open, two normally closed. I no. noticed that I switched them around because I was originally putting them on so that the normally open was on top of the normally closed. In this case, I put it so that my normally open is on top of normally open. Okay, normally open, normally open, three, four, three, four, and over here. Now, what's the benefit of stacking another one on top of the original? Well, because I, if I want multiple things to occur when I change the position of the switch, hmm. that the advantage. I, okay. I can multiply the number of contacts and literally put, well, as many as, uh, as it'll hold. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can put as many as you want on there, but of course, there's a limit in as much as you've got a, usually an enclosure that you're mounted in. And if the enclosure is six inches deep and each one of these is about an inch deep, you're probably going to be maxed out at about four of them. You know, otherwise you're hitting the bottom and shorting things out or whatever. Not really shorting things out, but... Now, as I, again, operate it, you'll notice in the back again, the red and green... Still kind of pop out there. All right. Okay. This would be in its shelf state. All right which is the way you normally do it. Now, in this case, I've got a push button, all right? It's similar. In this case, the company is basically uh, advertising their, their name on there. No, oh, so that's just the brand name? Yeah, uh, so okay. if I put this in a actual service I'd want to take that little there's probably a little plastic thing with its name on it and take that out of there in fact I can feel the plastic on there now the other thing I wanted to mention let's go back to the uh, let's go back to the selector switch when you go to mount this on the uh, the enclosure essentially what you've got is a uh, a 7 8 inch uh, diameter hole that you're going to need. Well, 7 8 just happens to be the same size as a half inch knockout. So, this 
size is very convenient and of course the manufacturer makes it for a reason because most electricians are going to have knockouts. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, here's a knockout kit. They make them big and small. In other words, this one goes up to, um, I believe, inch and a quarter. Maybe I'm wrong. It should tell me on the on the piece itself, but it's not. Um, but anyhow, I believe this is an inch and a quarter. This is a half inch knockout, three quarter, one inch, and an inch and a quarter. Yeah, cause it's not a big enough to be not big enough to be a. Um, inch and a half. Keep in mind that, uh, you know, you're, you're, when you're using a knockout and using them for conduit, that the half inch conduit has a, um, a wall thickness of 3 sixteenths. Okay, all conduit has a wall thickness of 3 sixteenths. So if you want to figure out what the outside diameter is, you take the nominal trade size half inch and add three eighths to it. So in which case half inch plus three eighths is a seven eighths. All right, so I have here a seven eighths inch knockout. So if I wanted to mount this to a paddle, in this case the seven eighths has a, a small um, A small diameter feed through, all right, which is good because that means you can get, use a standard half inch drill and you put that through the hole and then you essentially screw this down and as your threading it in Actually, it goes the other way around. I'm sorry. Let's let's show you properly. Yeah, maybe a good idea. This would go on one side. This goes on the other side. So you drill your half inch hole. You stick that on the one side. You stick this in the other side. Okay, and now you get to the point where it's tight against the panel. Okay, depending upon how thick the panel is. All right, so now what you do is you get it snug tight and then you take your wrench and tighten this and the cutting blade in the back is going to stay where it's at and as it's turning in, it's sucking into the outside plate. Okay, and eventually coming and punching the hole all the way through. Okay, so you need to make sure as you're doing that, this one has a, a nice bearing there, so it lets the um, inner race turn. Okay, as you can see, as, as I'd be screwing that in there, it's pushing it in deeper and deeper and eventually punches the hole through. Um, so again, punch, once you get up above a half inch, Okay, then you got basically a little more work to do because in this case you've got a 5 8 inch diameter or actually I think it's maybe even more than that but it's at least a 5 8 inch diameter. One way to get around it is you can use what's uni called a unit bit, a unibit and drill it out or you can get a larger size bit. If you're drilling wood, that's one thing. But when you're when you're drilling metal, not as easy to go through. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Well, it's not in a standard bit kit. 
usually it goes from like 1 16th to a maximum size of half inch. So what I've done in the past is I use a unit bit, a unit bit to open it up. And a unit bit is like a pyramid shaped bit that has cutting blades and edges and it'll take you from for example half inch to maybe another quarter inch and another quarter inch and another quarter inch on each little lip on the unit bit and you can basically open it up to whatever size you want so I've used that many times and when I bought these things I bought them specifically because they all had the half inch uh, size standard which is a three-quarter inch or I'm, I'm sorry a seven-eighths inch uh, hole knockout requirement okay so here's a pilot light for example this particular um, ah, it's a little tight okay same way it mounts on the top You push it through the opening. This is sticking on the outside, obviously. It's gasketed. You'd want that gasket to be on the outside surface because that's where any contamination would come from. Stick it through, and in this case, you can see it's got a rough surface on one side. You want to put that against the box and tighten it down, and it presses against the box, and it's securely mounted. Okay, going back to the uh, selector switch, this particular one has basically set screws in the back. So you punch it in your standard hole and you take these screws out to the point of being flush. Then you stick it in the hole, okay, and the operator could actually come off and this whole thing can stick through the, the outside. In other words, this operator can come off. So the top half, which is basically that metal part right here. Oop. Oopsie. Anyhow. Um, If you get it in the right position, it'll pull off. I had to push it in to get it to the right position. All right, so now that's going to go into the inside. Once you get it there, you put it in. Oh, it's keyed. Okay, you put it in, and then you use these set screws to push it against the panel on the inside. You got one on each side of the switch there. Right. Okay, and no one that fell out goes right there. This silver plate is going to ride on the you notice I'm holding the silver esculent, whatever they call it, the ring okay and the inside part rotates so you're basically pushing the contact block up against the back and this up against the front which allows you free movement of the rotary switch okay and beyond that they're they're fairly straightforward uh let me put that in so i don't lose it oh is a good thing very easy to okay, lose and as effects. you push it in there, so it'll allow up to like, uh, it looks like almost a quarter inch thick plate. That's kind of unusual. Typically it might be, you know, quarter inch uh, would be a very heavy panel. Okay, so it'd usually be Would that be like, like for like industrial panels maybe? Yeah, like a nuclear grade panel, you know, something that you don't want to destroy. A typical, the, I have boxes here, they're typically made of about a 16th inch steel. Uh, so an eighth inch plate is a fairly heavy plate, which would be about a 12 gauge 
or a 10 gauge. Okay, now, pilot lights. Okay, so we talked we talked a little bit about the, uh, we'll move back to the uh, push buttons. Again, if you look at the side here and look at the actual contact arrangement, okay, let me operate it a couple of times so that you can get a feel for it. Okay, and I'm pushing it in. And look at it, that's a normally open, and you look at the metal piece down below is being pushed up to make contact. So normally open, closes when you push it down. Now let's go to the other side, and guess what? Normally open, just like we said over here. Normally open was N -O. green. Angry. Okay, in this case, normally open is... So green. green. Okay. This case, normally closed. All right. It's a little harder to see because you got some printing on there. And you got the red with the orange, so it's kind of hard yeah. to see too. But again, it's red red flag on the side. It's a red piece that's moving. And in this case, it's closed right now. There's a bar that go, goes across the bottom, and the connection is down at the very bottom. Okay, where... This connection is pointed up. This connection is pointed down. All right. And you can see <coughs> the action as we go. Now, this particular brand of push button is not stackable. Okay, you get what you buy, which is a cheap and dirty push button. <laughs> All right. Now, to what mount What do the this, numbers mean on this one? Like, I'm seeing the... Like on this side, you have the 12 and the 24. Does that, is that um, it's basically just a way to identify the individual contacts. Okay. Oh, so you just got different numbers. 11, so you 12, don't get 23, 24. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's a convenient way when you're doing your wiring diagrams. So the 11 and 12 is going to be your red side, and the 12 and uh, 24 and 23. So gonna flash up over there. Like, here's my push button, my green push button. All right, and that happens to be the start. And I could come down here and mark those as, since it's a normally open one up there, I could mark it as, on the green side, 23 and 24. So I could put a little... 23 here and a little 24 there to tell you what the terminal designations are, which is convenient. Uh, it can get a messy drawing too. Okay, but that's not, I'm sorry, that's a push button. Over here is the selector switch. And in this case, normally open, we call this 23 and 24. All right, since the selector switch really doesn't care what direction it's going. Uh, it kind of doesn't matter. But an awful lot of times people want to be very exact with their drawings. They want to show every connection on every one with a number. Um, most of the time, for example, when you're, when you're taking a... Uh, when you're doing wiring, remember we put these wire numbers here, and in this case, this was wire number one. That's, did we ever put that down there? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I did, <laughs> but I never put the number there. This was number one, that's number two. Okay, so everything that's connected to one is on the hot side. Everything that's connected to number two is on the neutral side. All right, and it depends upon the individual company. Sometimes they will get into the individual termination points, especially if there's multiple termination points on a stackable, you know, selector switch. You know, this is 
11 and 23. Oh, I'm sorry. This is push button. Damn. Push button. Okay. But like on the uh, one here, the normally opens are designated three and four. Normally closed one and one two. two. Okay, and you could call it one tack one, one tack two for the first contact block. You know, a lot of different ways of doing it. Okay, because every contact block is identified in the same manner. But in having them labeled right, it's always good for troubleshooting after the fact to make sure the numbers match up right. Absolutely. And, well, nuclear is special, but uh, it's extremely important when you get into nuclear because you want to make sure you get everything back the same. Now, let's get back to the push button. We kind of already talked about how it operates. Let's talk about how it mounts. Um, in this case, you can see that we, we could probably pull the top off, but we'll probably break it if we do that. This particular one has a, a catch system where if you push it to one side, the entire part comes out. And again, it's keyed down below so that you can only get it in one way and you lock it into place when you're done. So when you go to mount it, you push it to the side, you pull out the top, you take your lock nut, this sticks on the outside of the panel, this locks it in place. Okay, now you're in, in place. Then you come over. It'll only go in one way. And you lock it. And it's done. Okay. So it's pretty nifty. And believe it or not, they were fairly inexpensive. Um, again, this is a fairly, you know, it's plastic. It's not the most expensive one. It's not what I would call industrial grade, but commercial grade, yeah. Again, cheap and dirty, not stackable, but most push buttons are stackable. All right. I think we showed how this works already. And again, these are keyed in there, so they can only go in one way. No, this is going key. in. Let's show that it's got the little ridges when you see in about the key. You see the little ridges in there? That's going to prevent it from going in a certain way, and then it locks in like that in that little ridge there. So that's what you're doing is you're putting it in and locking it with a twist into place. All right, so you figure out, don't force it. All right, it went in. When it does, and just lock it. Mm -hmm. Problem is these screws are, are hurting me screws now. Up. I, you kind of line up those ridges, give it a twist into place, and you're good. And when it's actually mounted to the contact block, it's easier to set the thing in there. You can see it's kind of sloppy and it doesn't lock into place until you've really got the contact block underneath it. All right, here, this is pretty straightforward. It's a typical, <coughs> excuse me, multicolored, um, what they call a pilot light. All right, this happens to be an LED. LED meaning a light emitting diode. So you see the LED on there, signal lamp, and it says ACDC 24 volts. Which is what I want. Okay, because I have a 24 volt control transformer, that's what I'm after. So again, same diameter as the push button, same diameter as the selector switch, same hole. 
So put it in the hole, gasket on the outside, and lock surface on the inside. Tighten it down. That's good to go. Cheap and dirty. In this case, your two connections are fairly well guarded. You don't have to worry about coming in contact with them. You come into the back, you take your Oop, I think I need a smaller screwdriver. Yeah, it's not quite making it in there. Anyhow, need a smaller screwdriver, a little less diameter on it. And I would call those guarded connections, meaning yeah, that you can't make accidental contact with them. And what's the X1 and the X2? I believe what you're looking at is X1 is going to end up like being on the X1 side of the transformer. Gotcha. Okay, which is going to be your hot, and your X2 is going to be your neutral. Okay, and does it matter with AC? No, it's not really dependent upon the direction. Okay, so it's not polarized. All right, uh, if this was in a DC situation, again, positive, negative, it would be the positive to one, the negative to two, all right? But besides that, that's about it. It's a single lamp. It is an LED, meaning that essentially it'll last a whole lot longer than those lamps in the control room that we've got, which are the uh, incandescents. And uh, we get called up. The electrical maintenance department, I mean, gets called up probably at least once a day, if not more, to replace lamps in the control room. Why? Because the operators have a tendency to break them off if we don't replace them for them.